Okay, everybody, welcome to the online talk, the fourth trimester vaginal steam study results with myself, Kelly Garza, Raquel Limas, and Kimberly Johnson. So uh, what I want to do is I just want to give an introduction to um, how the study even got started. And the journey starts with me and me learning about vaginal steaming. So I have a friend named Socho. Um, she was like, Kelly, let's go to this boom gathering. And I was like, okay, but you know, we can go to the club afterwards, right? And she was like, yes. <laughs> so I ended up at a womb gathering and it was taught by Marcia Lopez. Now, Marcia Lopez is an, an abdominal masseuse who specializes in Mayan massage. And she was teaching, um, you know, the women there are different practices for their womb health. And Raquel was there as well, actually. <laughs> that was the first time I met Raquel. And um, during the talk, Marcia mentioned uh, that vaginal steam, she mentioned vaginal steaming. She said, if people have bad menstrual cramps, they could do vaginal steaming. And she did a little, you know, um, example of how to do vaginal steaming. And, um, you know, I was just invited there by my friend. I wasn't really there, like, soaking up <laughs> what was going on. And when she said vaginal steaming, I just thought it was, like, the craziest thing ever. I didn't think I would ever do it, <laughs> okay? Um, but uh, within the next year, I want to say about six months later, I had a missing period. My period had been missing for several months due to stress. And so I, um, I remember just you know, really feeling like I was out of control with my emotions, like I had a hormonal imbalance. And so I you know, was sitting there thinking, what can I do to, get, to feel like myself again? And I realized I hadn't had my period in a long time. And that if I got my period back, hopefully it would help me to balance all my hormones and just feel like myself again. So I, um, for the first time in my life, thought, well, how do I get my period to come? Because I, I wasn't worried about my period missing just because my period was missing. I, I, I never care if my period goes missing. It's something that had happened throughout my life. So, um, so I thought, okay, so how do I make my period uh, start? And I went to sleep with that thought. And I woke up and I was like, ah! Vaginal steaming. <laughs> so I, um, I didn't have any direct contact with Marcia. I didn't know her. So I started to, you know, look around, see what I could find. I lived in LA. I lived in San Diego, actually. And I, um, I found a Korean spa in Los Angeles that offered vaginal steaming. Now, the year was 2011. There wasn't very much you could find about vaginal steaming, but I found a Korean spa. So I went to a Korean spa. I did a vaginal steam. And I drove home and my period came back. And that is, was my first experience with vaginal steaming. At the Korean spa, I learned that vaginal steaming can be used as a preventative healthcare practice for women. And specifically, the spa owner mentioned that you could steam once a month, that, that Korean women regularly will steam at the end of their period. So now my period started and I was thinking, you know what, I like this and my period feels healthier, so I'll steam at the end of my period. But I didn't like the spa experience. I didn't want to do it in public. So I created my own little steam seat at home and I started to steam uh, after my period um, for, uh, you know, after every period. And I did it for about three or four years before I ever told anybody, uh, before I ever mentioned it. It was just something that I did. and. Um, and so uh, when I got pregnant, one of my friends, um, she was like, what about vaginal steaming postpartum? And I was just like, I don't know anything about it. And so we were in a, um, we were in a Facebook group with a bunch of moms. And so she asked about it in that Facebook group. In that group, there was a Haitian woman and a Ghanaian woman that both spoke up and said, yes, we do, you know, in Haiti, we do uh, vaginal steaming postpartum. And the Ghanaian woman uh, talked about how they do it in Ghana postpartum. And um, so I ended up actually following uh, the instructions or the method more of, of what the Ghanaian woman uh, said that she had done, which was 30 days in a row postpartum, okay? So I set up my steam sauna, and after I had my baby, I did a postpartum steam protocol, and I did my steaming. So mind you, when I was pregnant, I had learned that I had fibroids, okay? And so, um, and then also once I had given birth, I had a really bad prolapse. My cervix was, uh, was at the vaginal canal opening and my uterus was basically falling, about to fall out or falling down and out, um, which is something that can happen after giving birth. I also had really bad swelling. 
Um, so when I did the steaming, I immediately felt relief. And every day that I steamed, I felt better and better. And by the time I was finished with the month long of steaming, I had my pre-pregnancy body back and I really felt like myself. Um, and not only that, the next time I had a checkup, I was like, hey doctor, how's the, how's, how are those fibroids looking? I had, I had detected three fibroids when I was pregnant. They were like, you don't have any fibroids. So I always believed that the steaming is what helped the prolapse. The steaming is what helped me with my full post, uh, you know, postpartum recovery. And the steaming is what got rid of the fibroids. Okay. So, um, so now as I started to talk to my mom friends and my other friends that were getting pregnant and hearing their experience, their experiences postpartum, I really felt like there was a difference between how I had recovered versus um, the other women that I was that were around me and that were talking to me, and I felt like it was because of the vaginal steaming. Okay, so um, at that time, uh, it was actually um, I had a little tea company, and I used to sell herbs to help boost breast milk. And so I was at a, a meeting with um, a bunch of doulas, with a bunch of birth workers, doulas and midwives, and a woman came up to me afterwards and was just crying to me about how bad her periods had been since she had her baby four years ago okay and I was listening to her and I was realizing that steaming could help her and so I, I told her about steaming and this was like really the first time that I had ever recommended it or told anybody about it so she said you want me to steam my what you know the common <laughs> response and so I said okay look it's vaginal steaming and you can get a chair and you get I'm trying to explain it to her and she said okay she said listen stop she said I want to do it I'll try it but I just don't want to have to deal with trying to make a steam seat. So can you just make me one? Here's some money. And so I was just like, okay. You know, so I took a steam sauna to her house and she had really great success with it. After just three steams, uh, her period had been 10 days long. It went down to five days in length and it had been really heavy and it went down to medium flow. Really incredible results. So much so that she started to tell all her friends about it. And the next week, three more people, three more people wanted to buy steam saunas from me. And I was like, just use her sauna. Like you guys can share, you know, like I was just thinking like that. But no, everybody wanted their own. So I made three more and I gave it to those women. The next week I had five orders from the friends that they had told. And it basically just continued like that, et cetera, et cetera. I sold more and more saunas without ever even starting a company. Um, I just ended up being a vaginal steam sauna supplier and also the herbs because everybody said, well, what do I do with herbs? Well, this time it was 2013 and there were no vaginal steam saunas or vaginal steam herbs for sale in the United States. I ended up being the first one that made vaginal steam saunas and herbs. And that's why everybody you know, was coming to me. So as everybody was coming to me and said, okay, well, I want to use vaginal steaming. then they would tell me about their periods and say, what herbs do I use? And I, um, so what I did was I actually brought an acupuncturist in. I was just like, oh, I don't know. You know, I can make you the sauna. Um, let's talk to an acupuncture and figure out what's going on. So at that time, um, I started to work with, uh, with Chris Gonzalez, who's known as the steamy chick acupuncturist. So we would work together. She would do a diagnosis. We would figure out what was going on. And then we would create custom herbs and um, a protocol, a steaming protocol that could help. And what we found, um, so, so Chris and I started to work together with people like that. And um, between 2013 and 2017, uh, we worked with over 700 women. Okay, and with each one of them, we did an intake form, and I would specifically be interested in how their period changed, how their next period looked after they did the vaginal steaming. So I would keep record of all of this information. Okay. Um, and what we learned during that time was that vaginal steaming is an incredible effective method to be able to deal with a wide array of women's health issues. Okay. Now during that time, a couple questions, you know, were, came up for me. Number one was where is vaginal steaming from? I had heard it was from Guatemala, you know, South Koreans were doing it, uh, Haiti and Ghana. And I was just like, but where does it originate? Who learned it from who? And so I was always paying attention to that and, and looking for different references. Um, and so I was taking note. And since that time, I've been able to take note of over 50 different countries uh, where vaginal steaming is practiced and the countries span the entire earth. So 
everywhere that you have populations of women, there is vaginal steaming, either currently or historically. The women have used vaginal steaming. And while I was paying attention to where vaginal steaming was from and learning that it's actually universal and it's from everywhere, women you know, have always practiced it, um, what, I know, what I noticed was that the most common use of it was postpartum, okay? So postpartum was the most common use of vaginal steaming. And that made a lot of sense to me because of the success that I had had with my postpartum vaginal steamings, okay? So the other question that was coming up for me is like, if this is so universal, if women everywhere in the world have used this, how come it's not more well-known? So um, what I have, you know, after doing more reading and looking into it further, what I found is that um, about 200 years ago in the 1800s was the rise of modern American gynecology. At that time, before then, women's health, birth, postpartum had been in the hands of women, midwives, doulas. Women were the birth workers um, at that time, and it was considered women's affairs. It wasn't even considered part of medicine. But when the rise of modern American gynecology happened in the 1800s, uh, Healthcare, women's health, very quickly transitioned from men's hands into women's hands, specifically because the male doctors um, did smear campaigns to say that midwives uh, shouldn't be delivering babies, that people should be delivering babies in hospitals. So you had a very quick transition from women taking care of women to now men taking care of women. And at that time is when you had the loss of the knowledge of vaginal steaming. And so that happened... Uh, big time in the 1800s, but it actually still occurs today. Like you still can find places in the world where vaginal steaming is practiced, usually by the midwives. And then where, um, as you see doctors and hospitals and clinics open up in these areas, you see that people stop those practices. Um, so you have, this is just as, as, as women's health has transitioned from women's hands to men's hands, um, we've had this continual loss of this knowledge and this practice, okay? now. Then that makes you think, well, you know, does that mean that it wasn't valuable or that it shouldn't be part of medicine? I would say no. I think what happened was the doctors didn't know about vaginal steaming, and so they never studied it and looked into it. Because the way that modern uh, gynecology arose was that the interests were in using surgery and pharmaceuticals for healthy women. So something like vaginal steam never actually even entered the equation as something that could be studied. Okay. So now, the, uh, so in the majority of places in the world, vaginal steaming is not really well known, but I have found a couple places where it's actually commonplace and everybody still practices it, okay? So a uh, small East African country of Eritrea, it's commonplace, okay? Uh, Suriname in South America, Palau in the South Pacific Islands, uh, Lithuania in Europe, and South Korea. And I just want to give you guys those countries from all around the world so you have a scope of exactly how widespread this practice is. And all of those countries, the women have maintained the practice despite uh, the rise of, of modern gynecology. And it's actually commonplace. Everybody just, just knows it. Everybody just does it. It's like, you know, uh, the, the woman in Lithuania who was telling me about the practice in Lithuania, she said, it's just as common as brushing our teeth and taking a shower. Everybody does it. Everybody does it all the time, <laughs> you know? So, um, so, uh, so anyway, so then um, I'm in the USA. I know I have, we have some people here from around the world, but I'm going to talk a little bit about the USA revival of vaginal steaming. So there were some massage therapists like Marcia Lopez that knew about it and have been learning about it, I think probably since the late 90s um, and practicing it. Uh, but it was just a few people, like far and wide, okay? <laughs> like just a few people knew about it. And I was lucky to learn about it from Marcia, to learn that the practice existed. And then you have Korean spas, because vaginal steaming is commonplace in Korea, as Korean populations live in the United States, especially anywhere you have a Korea town, like in Los Angeles, you have vaginal steam spots. Okay, so anywhere you find Koreatown, you can find uh, you can find um, sauna houses that then have vaginal steam in as well. Okay, so um, so that is where our beloved actress Gwyneth Paltrow learned about vaginal steaming. So Gwyneth Paltrow is an American actress. She's very famous, and she went to a Korean spa and did vaginal steaming. 
And so in 2015, uh, now four years after I've learned about it, and two years after I had been uh, practicing and helping women with it, um, Gwyneth Paltrow mentioned on her website, oh, by the way, everybody needs to go to, uh, to Coon Spa in Santa Monica and do a vaginal procedure. okay? So when Gwyneth Paltrow mentioned this, the media went wild. They're like, Gwyneth Paltrow is talking about vaginas. This is awesome. Also, every doctor that we are calling up is saying definitely don't steam your vagina. It's dangerous. They were saying you could die if you steam your vagina. You're going to get burnt if you do it. They were saying all of this scary stuff and spreading all this misinformation about vaginal steaming, including that you'll get infection. Um, and that it's uh, dangerous, and then also that there's no evidence it works. This is just, you know, fluffery. This is just like hippie talk, right? So I'm over here now. I my, mind you, I've been selling vaginal steam saunas and herbs, and, and seeing and witnessing how much it's helping women with their health. And now all of a sudden, you have every media outlet in the United States is saying, "Don't steam your vagina." When a Gwyneth Paltrow isn't a doctor, this is a terrible idea and spreading all this misinformation. And actually, it was scary. I remember reading those articles and feeling scared myself, like, oh my gosh, am I, am I gonna die? <laughs> you know, like it was, it was very scary. And my, the women that I had sold saunas were having those, you know, were all reaching out to me, very scared as well, like, what's going on? And so it put me in a strange situation because I have all of this evidence of the benefits of vaginal steaming. And now I'm seeing all of this misinformation spread about vaginal steaming that is turning people away from it. You know, and I had women that would say, oh, I wanted to try it, but I talked to my doctor and, you know, and I, I think I'll pass, right? Because they were getting all of this misinformation about it. So my response, um, you know, to this, this, this problem that there's no scientific evidence of it was just that there's no evidence because there haven't been any studies on it, right? How can you have evidence? Like there are, and, and for something not to have been studied doesn't mean that it's not valuable. It just means that it hasn't been studied, right? Not only that, and case studies are evidence. And now I've got hundreds of case studies of the benefits of vaginal steaming, including my own, right? And hundreds of people that vaginal steaming has helped. It was kind of a problematic situation to be in when I know that the case studies show that vaginal steaming has a lot of potential for being able to help women. So I, um, at that time, um, I started to conceive of what kind of studies could be done about vaginal steaming that could help to not necessarily persuade doctors to recommend it, but which could be used to show women that vaginal steaming is safe and does have health benefits, okay? So I designed a series of studies. I actually have, <laughs> I have a lot, <laughs> okay? Um, but this is the first one that has now come to fruition. And Kimberly was actually a big part of that. Now, I have designed my studies, um, but, and I actually have started to work with uh, different groups of researchers. However, the process of getting a study done is a long process. It takes a lot of application. And it takes being able to get funding, and all of that takes a while. Okay, so now Kimberly Johnson, uh, we're about to switch over to her. I met her in I want to say 2015 at a talk, and uh, I was giving a talk on vaginal steaming, and she was there, and she was writing her book the fourth trimester at the time. And afterwards, she said, "I really want to talk to you more, and I want to make sure I include this in the book because I think it could be an important postpartum practice." And so her and I uh, stayed in contact since then. She actually uh, bought some herbs and bought a steam sauna and started to use it. And, herself, and she herself experienced the benefits of vaginal steaming. And, um, and then we stayed in contact. And since we've become uh, colleagues and we've become friends, and she's become a very uh, staunch postpartum steam advocate. Okay. So Kimberly and I got together, and I'm going to pass it on to Kimberly now to explain. Um, why she wanted to get involved in doing a postpartum research study. She actually ended up helping to commission and fund this study because she felt like it was so important for it to happen. Okay, Kimberly, you're up. Thanks, Kelly. I'm super digging your timeline because 
it's so exciting to think about, you know, your journey starting in 2011 and it's only 2019 and how far women's healthcare has come in eight years and how much more information we all have. Uh, you know, my own postpartum experience was so surprising and so difficult that that's why I got interested in postpartum health because I didn't even know that there was any special needs. And now I think most women know that the postpartum time is a special time and that special care is needed at that time. And so, you know, I wrote the book. Uh, the book came out in 2017, but it took four years to write. So when I met you, I was in the middle of writing it. But I don't ever really like to be a proponent of something without trying it. So as you said, I came up to your house. I got one of the chairs that I feel like I have one of the original chairs. And uh, I got my own period online. Um, I It was getting really short in intervals and within the first, I don't really believe in miracle cures a lot of the time. So I thought, oh, well, you know, 20, it was like 22 days, 23 days. I thought it'll take a few cycles to get it back to 28 and it got back to 28 in the first cycle. And so I started paying attention. Yay. And then I, I had had a prolapse when I had a baby. I had had a fourth degree. Well, it's controversial what degree tear I had my midwives and people who treated me afterwards, but I had a tear that took a really long time to heal. I had hemorrhoids and I just kind of intuitively felt after doing the steaming, wow, my own experience would have been way different had I had this as a tool and you and I talked about it. And then as we continued, you know, I'm, I'm always looking for the most powerful intervention point. I come from a policy background. You come from a statistical analysis and policy background and act background in community activism and organizing. And I've been mulling around on this question of, okay, this, we have a really big problem. We have like every woman needs postpartum care and it's very difficult for MDs to serve women postpartum. So women just get a six month, a six week checkup. And most women will tell you it's really not that helpful for them. And then midwives are overtaxed because they, you know, their birth schedule is, is so tough. And so it's hard for them to do as many postpartum visits. So it's like, okay, well, the community used to do postpartum care. It used to be because you had extended family networks and there were people in your family that didn't work. And so, you know, your grandmother or your aunt or your uh, sisters-in-law or whoever in the family system wasn't working because now everybody's got to work because of the way the economy is. And so I left this big gap and, and, and this was across cultures in general, right? Like, because in the U S even in the U S 120 years ago, there was a lion period and it was just known that after having a baby that you needed to rest. So in talking, it was like, okay, so what's the way the question to me was, what's the way that we can get the most amount of women, the best amount of care that can solve the most problems at once. And that's the cheapest. So, lowest price point, highest, uh, you know, kind of surface area, and like also low cost of entry and easy to use, right? Because we see like this crazy new postpartum drug that they just came out with is like, it's cost like $40,000 and you have to stay in the hospital for three days. And to me, it's like trying, it's like trying to solve a problem that doesn't even have to happen. So, uh, so we talked about it and we had a lot of theories, but you're like, okay, we need data. So we thought, okay, well, steaming's not very expensive. And uh, so far, a lot of your practitioners are in many different types of communities. And there's, as far as we know, we don't know of any serious contraindications, but now, you know, we had some also ideas about that. And so that's why I wanted to go for it. And also because I really believe in grassroots change. I'm, I don't want to wait for the presidency to change or big corporations to change their maternal leave policies. Or, you know, I want to fight for those things and vote for those things. But I also want women to be empowered about our own health. And there's things that we know how to do. And we can call them technologies. We can call them tools. But they're age old and they're intuitive. And they, they're things that we can do for one another. So, uh, so we went for it. Yeah, and can you mention, like, I think one thing that, you know, that we, we talk about is that we have a big community of women around us. And when you start talking about these issues, then you learn what's going on. 
So when you published the book, the fourth trimester, I mean, what happened? And and like like because basically you were like you were responding to this need, right? You were responding sure. to a need from what happened as the stories were pouring in. Was you shared your story? You had all of these other stories pouring in, and right. it was beyond your capacity to be able to even help all of these people, exactly. right? You had a you so had a waiting list, right? Not only the stories, but also just with um, you know, I just I. I was going to say used to. I mean, I do hands-on, hands-in work, and I specialize in birth trauma and sexual boundary repair. And, yeah, there was just so many people that needed help that, I, you know, I would. it was like I would go on to another city. I would post something in my stories on Instagram, and I would get my inbox would get flooded of, like, I don't, I don't know if you're working, but, like, could you just help me? I just had twins. It's 11 weeks. I'm prolapsed. I'm freaking out, you know. And so it got to be really overwhelming because I had practices in Vancouver, L.A., San Diego, New York and Chicago and like my waiting list in New York got to have 120 people on it and so I'm just like okay and I have a lot of different specializations that enable me to be able to give that care and I'm like okay training people is a good idea so that other people can give that kind of care but at the same time we need something that's more democratic because there's only certain people that are going to find me there's only certain people that can afford a session there's only and and I believe that vaginal steaming is one of those tools. And I, and I believe, yes, we, and we've, our study proves that it is so valuable postpartum, but I, I also believe in preventative health care so that if we had this as a tool, um, you know, I'm so excited for my daughter and for your girls who are going to have this from the very beginning where the, you know, the first menstrual cycle, she's already going to know how to take care of her. She already does know. She tells her classmates about it. She's known as the period person in her, in her class because the people who have their periods come to her for supplies and to ask her questions. So, uh, I, I really like to invest in these tools that aren't just isolated things that you drop in where you build up this practice of following the rhythm of slowing down when you have your period and using the steaming, which is is not of anything about um, cleaning the vagina, or you know, it's about like helping the uterus have a full cleanse and taking care of our feminine health as something that's very central to who we are and so integral to gynecological health, sexual health, pelvic health, and those things don't often get put together. So, yeah, the need has just. I mean, I think that the need was always there. But the amazing thing is that women are now saying this isn't this isn't good enough. Like I don't want to keep wetting my pants for my whole life and thinking this is normal. I don't want to live with this pain of the scar tissue or. And so as it's talked about more, more women are like, oh, I think that my back might be hurting because it's hurting only since I had a baby, and maybe that's why. Or you know, I think my now that people are more familiar with my abdominal massage. And, and even just organ position in general, people are going, well, hey, maybe my uterus is retroverted and that's what's causing some of my period cramps. Or maybe, you know, there's these high incidences of fibroids and all these things that um, steaming can potentially be so useful for. So, uh, yeah, I was really excited to see because, and I still am, um, I know that you have practitioners in almost every state except three states. And just to see this become something that, uh, women tell each other about and that we can feel into ourselves and rather than deferring to what someone else is telling us we should do that we actually could check into ourselves and say well intuitively does that feel true for me and then reach out and have an affordable practitioner that's available that you can book an appointment with and you don't have to wait till a six-week visit because we all know six weeks it's not quote unquote too late. It's never too late. Healing is always possible. Repair is always possible. And everyone listening should know that there's, it's never an end game. It's just that you can get a bit of, I, I don't know if you can call it a head start, but it's just, it's, it, there's, it's a potent time where whatever you put into the system, it's like you get exponential benefits. And so taking, and, and we'll talk about it. And, uh, as I want to pass the mic here, but that's, Part of the thing is that some of these benefits, we can quantify them, we can look at the graph, and I know Raquel's going to talk about this, but 
you, it means something different. So for instance, the suturing was something that we saw a really strong effect on so that the people who had sutures and were steamed didn't feel pain anymore at day eight, but the people who had sutures and didn't steam still felt pain all the way at the six week mark. So that is so um, important in terms of imagine how you feel day to day. If you're your nervous system is wired to feel like something's wrong because pain makes you feel like there's something wrong. So every single day, all day long, you're wondering, is this going to stay this way forever? Is there something wrong? Do I need to call a doctor? Um, am I doing the right thing? And then, you know, all the physical positions that you need to be in breastfeeding, but also potentially are way more uncomfortable because there's friction. And so it just, it can't be underestimated how the elimination of some of these simple things has a huge ripple effect. We weren't able to measure objectively people's overall happiness and satisfaction, but I'm fairly positive because if, if you don't have those lingering worries, if your organs are in the right place, if you're not feeling friction and pain, you are going to feel more available to life. You are going to feel that you have more energy to be with your other children or to be with your baby or to be with your partner, or to be with yourself. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. So Kimberly, um, so Kimberly is just like, okay, Kelly, listen, she's like, we're meeting, right? She goes, we need to just get a study done ASAP so that this can get to women. And I'm like, yeah, no, like studies take time. They take a lot of funding. And I was actually in the uh, process of transitioning from selling saunas to training practitioners because the need was so great. I had that same thing where I was getting flooded with communication from women with these stories of just how they weren't getting help and how they had these problems that weren't getting addressed, right? So we were both dealing with this situation. We've got so more women than we can even help who have problems, right? And who want to uh, you know, we're looking to vaginal seeming from, from me and, and the type of um, therapies that, that Kimberly offers from her, right, to help. So anyway, so, so I was like, uh, I was like, but I was like, maybe we could just do a small pilot. Study. And if we funded ourselves, if we do crowdfunding and funded ourselves and just do something really small, maybe we could at least get something organized and on paper. And that is what the sports trimester vaginal steam study is. It is a small little pilot study, okay? A very, very small group just to show um, the potential um, that vaginal steaming has. So we wanted to have, I think, 30 people. We ended up saying, okay, we'll do 20 uh, just in the interest of time and, and funds and resources. And then we actually ended up getting uh, 12. So we ended up with six in the steam group and six in the control group. And instead of doing 30 days of steaming, we did five days of steaming. So we started on day four and we did day four, day five, day six, day seven, day eight. So Raquel was the one that administered all of the steaming. And before she steamed anybody on day four, she would do uh, an, a full exam on them. And then she, after all of the steaming on day eight, she did a full exam. We also had a control group where she did exams on day four and day eight so that we could compare the differences. And then Kimberly was like, well, we need to also look at what happens at six weeks because that's when women are expected to be healed up. So then Raquel went back and also visited with people at the six week mark. So I'm actually going to turn it over to Raquel to talk more about that process, the exams, what indicators you looked at and how that went. Hi, everyone. Happy to be here. Happy to be um, a part of this study. Um, yeah, at the time, I feel like I'm going to throw in a little bit about my timeline coming in. I had just started, well, Kelly and I have been connected throughout the years. And when you were really taking off with steaming, I took off to go study midwifery. And then when I got back, we just connected and you had hit me up about doing the consults and referring people to me. And then a couple months later, you were like, Raquel, we're doing this study. And usually when you call me, it's more like, okay, what do we need? It's not like why or what. It's like, all right, what are we doing? <laughs> so, and you're like, and we got on a call, I think the three of us, so that Kimberly could meet me. Um, Cause you're like, you're the only one I trust. <laughs> and I was like, cool. So it was such an honor to, to one, be a part of the study. and and 
yeah, just be involved. So predominantly the people who who were in the study, everybody did identify as a, as a woman, I should say, as a mother, um, and had full breasts, meaning that there are other types of pregnancies and other types of people um, who feed and nourish children. But for this study specifically, everybody that was recruited did identify as a woman, did identify as having a vagina, and did identify as having breasts too. So I feel like that's really important to say. Um, and they were from various backgrounds. We've had, you know, Latinas, African Americans, um, Jewish, Caucasian, you know, Peruvians from all over the world too, Indian, um, from India. So the population of folks that we, we recruited was, um, you know, from various parts um, of LA, but various parts of also different cultural backgrounds. So um, that was really phenomenal. Most of the participants were, gave birth in a hospital, um, although a few of them gave birth at home as well. The majority of people we did recruit were referred to, to us and to the study by doulas and midwives. So um, big shout out to doulas and midwives. None of them were my personal clients. Um, a few of them did come to my childbirth education class and then um, potentially signed up for the study. But every the majority of the people were recruited from, from doulas and midwives and then the vast networks of community of people that um, Kimberly and Kelly and all of us are connected to. And every visit was done at home. So for me, that meant being on call for every single person <laughs> who was giving birth because we wanted it to start on day four. So there were so many people who reached out and were like, my sister just gave birth, but it was like day eight or day 12. And I'm just like, oh, it hurt my heart to have to say no to them um, because I wanted to steam everybody so badly. So all of the visits were done um, in their home. So that's me driving around all of LA with all my steam gear in my car, um, all the herbs I have a sweet, sweet mobile setup at this point in my life now. And, and meeting with everybody individually. And um, I think that was one of the most impactful things. I'm going into people's homes and sharing with them about their experiences. So what was nice about that is predominantly me being the one doing all the visits. There was a short stint where I needed an assistant because I injured myself um, dancing. Um, but this was an assistant that I trained to support me and and really she just helped me carry all the stuff while I like wobbled into the home <laughs> But shout out to her and um, But I was timing everything, you know, people were asking about times and it, and I monitor all the timing for for the, the for the steams that we did specifically for the steam group 15 minutes um, and I use the same pot obviously cleaned each time, but the same pot for each person. So there was the exact same measurement of water within there and the exact same measurement of herbal combination for each and individual person. Cause I know, I think we've gotten into the, like, how do you know if, if it was that long or this one, because as, as Kimberly was talking about, um, you know, steaming can be a very individual and instinctual process. And, you know, there are slight variances um, depending on what type of condition you're working in and how you're how you're maneuvering it yourself, but for this purpose for the study, we were trying to keep things as concrete as possible and as re uh, repli replicable. I think that's how you say that. <laughs> you all know what I mean. So that it can carry forward, so that people can do more of these studies, so that we can do the study again, but with a larger population um, and through a university somewhere, so that they can pick that that up. Um, some of the things we looked at as far as far as you know how the steaming was impacting um, these people and these participants were fundus height, really looking at how how's the uterus working, right? How's the uterus working, and then how's your overall health? Things like blood pressure, um, your pulse, weight, um, the size of your waist, right? As the uterus shifts, because we don't realize how much space the uterus takes up in the abdomen, abdominal cavity with even after a birth. And even if you've been clearing, sometimes if it's not shifting down in the right place, it can create gases with other things, pressing up onto other organs. So that can impact even body image, right? As you're trying to come back and have this new identity of being a parent, 
um, just these different aspects are important to note and to look at how your uterus is coming back into its optimal alignment. Um, and so it was my hands measuring whenever anybody needed to feel a uterus or touch a body, that was me doing that. Um, so it's the same consistent practitioner, because um, it's, it's just me. <laughs> and the things that were slightly different is, you know, as a midwife, we do normally visit people in the postpartum and we feel with our hands. We've been trained to feel with our hands how this how this uterus moves and um you know we normally quantify it by our finger breath so feeling the uterus below the um, umbilicus the, below the umbilical button um by like how many finger breaths i feel and um so what was interesting in the study is, is using busting out my measuring tape and being like okay i need to quantify this maybe a little bit more um so that we could really use it so we can really see what's happening and so I would use my hands, but then I would also actually physically feel the width of the uterus and measure the uterus um, from how wide it is and then from the top of the uterus to where I felt it in the pubic bone. Um, so that's not something I would normally typically do in a, just a regular postpartum visit, but it was really cool to see because I don't think anybody has ever measured that, like, ever. Um, so the, that was a really awesome awesome thing to to look at and to see how it's going. Um, some of the 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 other factors that we looked at um, were observational as far as or or objective as as far as how the mothers describe them. Um, that's like the pers personal experience of of pain and even trying to moderate that as on different levels as moderate, medium, mild, intense. Um, and so quantifying that is, it is based on their personal experience, but within a certain scale, as far as like, how did their breasts feel? Um, how did the pain feel going to the bathroom? You know, peeing, bowel movements, et cetera. Um, others were objective me, visually assessing the labia, visually assessing how, um, you know, the lips are falling, how red, how swollen, and comparing that, having that visual comparison. Um, over the several different days and different time frames, um, and that was so that was part of my my as a research um, observation. Um, and then there, you know, um, I'm trying to think of what else I've got. I'm looking over at the. Can you uh, say my, how how uh, how long you did the vaginal steam session, like with each client? Oh yeah, yeah. So the steaming itself only took you know, it was 15 minutes for each participant. Um, and so in that, in that time, as I'm getting the herbs ready, that's also time of prepping. So I had maybe 10 minutes on top of that prep, prepping the herbs. And in the time that I'm prepping the herbs, we're assessing the other parts of the body, or there are other times when it's like, you gotta stop and feed. So, you know, babies are welcome throughout this process, of course. So I would normally spend, um, even though the steam visit was like 15 minutes, I would be at everybody's house for, you know, at least an hour doing, doing everything. Um, even if they weren't necessarily steaming, but like, you know, if your baby has to feed, you have to feed, you got to get up to go to the bathroom. Things are just a little slower in the postpartum. So, um, so at least an hour, sometimes an hour and a half, depending on what was going on with baby and the family at that, at that time. Um, but the steams were 15 minutes. 15 minutes each and everybody received the same length uh they used the same steam setup and the same herbs and the same herbs okay yeah and the hardest part was to tell people that they had to get up off of the steam chair <laughs> that was the hardest part why <laughs> because everybody wanted to stay on longer and i think even in the questionnaire and we had talked about this when we were formulating the study about like how long do we get people to steam and we were like do we do the full 30 minutes because, you know, in other, other times it's a full 30 minutes that, that, that people seem in the postpartum yeah. and we were going back and forth. Do we do it shorter? Do we keep it universal? Do we keep it longer? How do we do it? You know? And so we stuck with 15 minutes, a good halfway point and everybody, I don't think I had one person who wasn't like, oh, <laughs> Can I sit here longer? <laughs> oh my god! Just a dick having to be like, no, <laughs> you can't. You know, 
the real truth is i think that's why it's so beneficial is because it just feels nice like it just feels good okay so let's look at this data oh my gosh we've been 45 minutes into this so let's look at this data now um okay so raquel mind you she's a midwife she did the exam she worked with all the women she worked with the steam group she worked with the non-steam group we had uh, six and six in each group, but then I think uh, one person dropped out of the control group. So we ended up with five people in the control group and six in the steam group that we were able to compare on days four, days eight, and six weeks, okay? So let's look at this data. So at that point, so Raquel uh, compiled all of the data, and at this point, uh, I passed all of the data over to Dr. Jalet uh, Boyd Phillips, uh, who has her PhD. Um, in a research-based uh, field and is a published um, researcher and, uh, and writer. So, um, so Dr. Jale Boyd, uh, she couldn't be here today. She was going to, but something came up last minute. And so, um, so, she, so I'm gonna present the data for you. She put it together in an awesome report and we put it together on the fourth trimester vaginalsteamstudy.com so you can get the full report. And we also created a slideshow in case anybody wants to present the data. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen with you guys right now, um, and we will take a look at, uh, at some of the findings, some of the indicators. Um, can we also, just real quick, can we address, because there's someone who asked why we're, we started at four days as opposed to waiting till someone stops bleeding? Um, because I find it a super common question. Yeah, it's a common question, and I think we should get to it, but let's get into the data first. I actually wrote it, I noted it um, for Kelly who asked, um, and, and then we'll get to that in the end, because um, we want to make sure we get through the data, and then we can stay as long as we want and do questions and answers. Um, but I know some people will have to go after the hour mark. Okay, so, um, so here is, um, this is on the, uh, the website, fourthtrimestervaginalsteamstudy.com. This is available for anybody to read anytime. And very specifically, we created this for women so that they could go and read this and decide themselves and have something to compare to the scary news articles that nobody should steam and that it's unhealthy for you. They can have something to compare in order for them to make an educated, a more educated and informed decision about whether or not it's something that they would like to try and whether or not it could benefit them. Okay, so... Um, so I'm just going to go through some of the, um, the data. I'm just going to go through the, uh, the graphs with you guys. Okay. So, um, the first thing that Raquel did was she measured the blood pressure and the pulse. So over here in purple, we have the blood pressure. So the control group is in the dark purple. And so what we saw is on day four, uh, they had a blood pressure about yay high. I don't have the exact numbers. Up. <laughs> um, and by day eight, their blood pressure had actually gone up. Okay, now when we look at the STEAM group, uh, their blood pressure actually started a little bit higher on day four, and you see the opposite trend. Their blood pressure actually went down. After five consecutive days of steaming, their blood pressure had gone down instead of up. So a very interesting finding that the trend was going opposite directions. Those that weren't steaming, their blood pressure was going up. Those that were steaming, their blood pressure was going down. Everybody was within a healthy range. But I think that trend is what's interesting, especially because blood pressure, uh, high blood pressure is one of the dangerous things that postpartum moms deal with, um, specifically when it comes to preeclampsia, which can be life-threatening. So this idea that this, this, this finding that the steam trend went down can be very significant when it comes to possibly preventing preeclampsia or when it comes to even treating it. We don't have that information because we weren't able to, we didn't work with a, a group of people who were at risk, but it's a very interesting finding, the, the, the difference in the trend. Now, mind you, after day eight, nobody steamed again. Okay, so all of the steaming was finished, and what you saw was that when the control group stopped steaming, their blood pressure actually went back up. Whereas what you see is, uh, and, and at six weeks, the control group, now the control group on the other hand, finally their blood pressure did start to come down. And at the six weeks mark, both of the groups ended up with the same blood pressure, which is pretty interesting, okay? And we found the same with the pulse. It was the exact same thing. Um, the control group's pulse, rate went up between day four and day eight. And the STEAM group, who actually started with um, a much higher pulse, their pulse went down 
And in fact, with the steam group, it looks like their polls uh, continue to come down a little bit further. And by six weeks, uh, everybody ended up with the same poll rate. Now, we don't know how the six-week indicator would look different had the steaming continued. Um, but what we found is that at least in that first week, um, the steaming helps the blood pressure and the pulse to have the trend of going down instead of going Okay, now I'm gonna quickly move through this because because uh, <laughs> an hour is almost up. <laughs> um, so uh, the next indicator um, that Raquel measured was gonna be the bundle height and width. Okay, bundle is like the, the top part of the uterus. Okay, so we're basically looking at the uterus size. Okay, so she looked at the height and she looked at the width and she also looked at how many fingers below the sternum, okay? So if you look at this graph, then basically this top line would kind of be like where the sternum is, and she was measuring uh, where the uterus was and compared to that area, okay? And so over here on the left, uh, you have the control group. So, uh, you know, this big, uh, she kind of, made, Shelley made a uterus. <laughs> she made it look like a uterus. This big uterus in the back of the dark red is at day four. And then on day eight, you can see their uterus size had gone down. And this is what it looked like at day eight. And by six weeks, it had gone down. Uh, this bottom line represents the pubic bone. And it had gone down. One person didn't have it below the pubic bone, but she had a pre-existing surgery, which might have been the reason why. But we will say that for the most part, everybody's uterus had gone down by that six weeks. So now let's compare that to the seam group. The seam group, day four, this dark purple or dark pink is their starting uterus sizes, the average of everybody. Now look at what happened by day eight. It was significantly, their uterus was significantly lower, uh, much further below the sternum than, than the control group. And not only that, the entire uterus, the width and the height was significantly smaller. And then by the six week mark, it was completely uh, below the as it should be. So what we see here is that the steam group, steaming accelerated the rate at which the uterus went down to size. Now what this means in function is that that was, as the uterus goes back down to size, that accelerates the rate that all of the rest of the organs can return to their normal location and function as well. It also accelerates the rate that the woman can get back into her normal clothes and doesn't actually still look pregnant, okay? So, um, so that is going to be um, pretty incredible how quickly the steaming, how much quicker it helped that uterus to return to its restoration, which helps the, all of the organs to go back into their normal place, which helps her normal functions when it comes to urination, when it comes to bowel movement, and when it comes to digestion, okay? So there are really significant reasons why that uterus restoration, uh, you know, needs to go down and, um, and why it's, it's, it's healthy for the woman, okay? Okay, so moving on, moving right along here. Um, Raquel measured, uh, she took a, she, she measured the waist, the width of the waist, okay? And this is the um, graph showing the width of the waist. In purple, we have the control group. They started uh, right here, it looks like about 38 inches. And then uh, at, at day four, by day eight, they had actually, their waist was wider, okay? So they had actually gained uh, inches on their waist by day eight. And then at six weeks, it had gone down, okay? With the, Steam group, on the other hand, on day eight, they started uh, their waist, they actually had a larger average waist size. So they were starting with the larger waist size. And by day eight, you see the opposite trend. Rather than their waist getting larger between days four and day eight, their waist went down significantly by day eight. So steaming seemed to accelerate the rate at which the waist went down in size, okay? And I think this has to do with the fact that the uterus was going back down to size. I think those two are related. Um, and at six weeks, the steam group actually ended up, I think it was, I don't have all the numbers in front of me. I think it was um, an inch or so. Uh, some, it, it, some, some amount, they ended up less. It doesn't, you can't really see it that well here, but the steam group ended up with us um, losing a lot more off of their waste than the control group ended up. Let me look at those numbers right here. 
So where's the control group lost a total of five pounds and two inches? Uh, the steam group lost seven pounds and three inches. Okay, so they ended up losing, um, losing more off of the waste. Um, and, uh, and the same finding uh, was for weight as well. Um, okay, yeah, we just did both right here. So, um, so the same thing was found for the, for the weight, whereas the control group lost a total of five pounds, the steam group lost a total of seven pounds. So another thing that Raquel did was she actually looked at their labia. She just looked at it to see what it looked like, okay? And um, she was specifically, uh, some of the things that she was able, the observations uh, that she was looking at. On day four, everybody had swelling and gapping, which is like droopy, droopiness, okay? So everybody had that um, on day four. And we'll look at this, um, this graph to look at it. The control, so, so this is uh, day four, this per, these purple, um, these purple uh, pie, pie charts. So um, the steam group actually had, it looked like they had more gapping um, and the control group had more swelling. But what you have is universally, everybody had swelling and gapping on day four. Now by day eight, Raquel um, noticed for the control group that all of them had improved. Okay, all of their swelling and gapping had improved, but they were still healing. In other words, they all had some, still had some indicators of swelling and gapping, just not as bad as it was on day four. Okay, um, so then when we compare that to the STEAM group on day eight, um, you had 66% of them, four out of six of them, actually were healed. There was no more swelling or gapping at the day eight mark. And then two out of six of them, 33%, still were in the healing phase. Okay. And then what we found at six weeks was that both groups were healed by six weeks. So this is pretty significant because this relates to, you know, pain. There's like there's pain with that swelling and gapping, and there's also discomfort when it comes to uh, using the restroom. So it's pretty significant that you had. 66%, uh, four sixths of the steam group had actually, was actually completely healed by day eight. So it's a significant difference uh, compared to um, none of the steam, none of the control group was healed. Okay, so moving on. Um, so another thing that we looked at was the lochia that uh, Raquel measured was their lochia and the discharge that they were having, the postpartum discharge is called lochia, okay? So lochia is measured by midwives in three different colors. They're looking at the red stage is the rosa. Then it moves into pink, which is serosa. And then it moves into a yellow stage, which is known as alba. Okay, so Raquel looked at the two different groups and what stage they were in. And what she found was um, for the control group, they were all in the stage one. And then by day eight, several of them were still in stage one and a couple of them had moved into stage two. And by six weeks, uh, four out of five of them still had Tokyo. They were still in the, the final stage, okay? So only one person in the control group, only one person had their, their Lokia had entirely resolved. Now that six week is again, I'm so glad we measured the six weeks because this is when people are supposed to be considered all the way healed and ready to be able to return to their normal exercise and and, and uh, sex, right? So four out of five of the people in the control group still had discharge coming out, the postpartum discharge at that stage. When we compare that to the STEAM group, um, the STEAM group started off, you know, the same, uh, but by day eight, after five days of consecutive steaming, they were all in the second stage. They were all in the cirrhosis stage. And by the six weeks, only one out of six of them still had the final alpha stage. Okay, so pretty significant difference that everybody, almost everybody in the STEAM group, their lochia was, uh, was almost entirely dissolved by the six weeks, okay? Now, my experience with steaming, I do use steaming within the first, uh, before, um, before bleeding stops. And <clears throat> what I found is that when steaming starts, the earlier steaming starts, uh, the sooner this lochia was resolved. Now, we didn't, remember, we didn't do any steaming between day eight and, day, and, and six weeks. But I do believe that this person wouldn't have had any, um, wouldn't have had any lochia by six weeks had they continued. What I've seen is that it can resolve uh, pretty, pretty quickly. Now, mind you, the lochia is 
it's the leftover pregnancy matter that needs to clear out. There's no actual reason that it needs to stay for a long time in the uterus. And clearing out the lochia is one of the things that can help the uterus go back down to size, which can help all of the organs and the rest of, you know, and all the ligaments and all the tendons return to their normal position and function. Okay. So clearing that lochia out quicker, as it happened in the STEAM group, um, can be really beneficial in helping the mom to have that full postpartum recovery as well as helping her other organs be able to return to their function. And then also, do, it's just a comfort thing. It's not comfortable having to have, a, you know, having a panty liners, pads, you know, and, and, and this discharge coming out, right? And especially at six weeks as people are returning to, are supposed to be returning to, to work and exercise and sex, you know, the lochia is, you know, it's, a, it's another thing to, uh, it, it, you know, there's, there's not really any reason for it at that point. By six weeks, the pregnancy uh, lochia, the pregnancy discharge that still needs to come out, should have come out all the way by then. And I'd like to add, Kelly, that, you know, I think when we see this and looking at this is I'm really curious of how many people aren't getting an effective clearing of their uterus and therefore dealing with other health issues along the way that, you know, whether it be a year later, whether it be three years later, whether it be when they're a grandmother, because of this impact of not helping the uterus at, I think I like the way Kimberly said it, this like, this point of most impact in the postpartum. Right. You know, yeah. your, your uterus is primed to do it then. So, you know, this well, I think is really a, a, a look and a telling of long-term uterine health. Right. And you know, thank you for bringing that up. What I've found is that whether or not a woman gets the lochia all the way out postpartum is the indicator for whether or not her period returns, uh, how her period return is going to look. So that woman that I was talking to, the first one that said, well, can you just make me a vaginal steam sauna? Here's some money. Um, she was complaining about how bad her periods had been after her, uh, she had five pregnancies and after her fifth and all the other ones everything had returned normal her period was normal and after this fifth one it just turned returned so bad just this really heavy bleeding all these clots and when I was talking to her I was able to identify that she hadn't got that full postpartum cleanse and that's why her periods were so bad and that's why even even four years later after just a little bit of steaming it was able to help her with her period now get that stuff out of there and i believe these are all my theories and just my observations from my experience of what i'm looking at i believe that it was getting that stuff out that was able to then take the amounts of days of down and the heaviness of she was experiencing down and that mind you she had gone through four years of periods like that and shed a lot of tears and had a lot of headaches and was dealing with it because of all that blood loss so totally, like, I, I do think that a lot of women are dealing with the long-term health effects of not having that, that full uh, uterine cleanse postpartum. Okay, and sutures. Okay, so Kimberly in particular dealt with um, suturing after her postpartum experience is something she writes about in her book and something that a lot of people, you know, are now speaking up about and looking for help with. So... I didn't have any sutures, and so I didn't have any personal experience about sutures with vaginal steaming, but what I did find is that when people steamed, they said it relieved their, su their sutures, but it wasn't something that I had even predicted with the study that we would have a big finding. So, um, so here's what we found. By, at day four, everybody was uncomfortable, and Raquel measured in particular uh, pulling, itchiness, uh, tenderness, and... Um, those were the things that she was looking, looking at. Tightness, tenderness, itchiness, okay, and pooling. So that was what we're calling discomfort. So at, by day four, so, oh, another finding was almost everybody, nine out of 11 of the participants had sutures, had sutures, okay? So it was pretty, it was a lot of people who had the sutures. <clears throat> so it's, a, it's a, a widespread thing that people can expect to have sutures, okay? At least for now, the way that things are going. So nine out of 11 of our participants had sutures. And at day four, all of them were uncomfortable. After five days of steaming, the steam group had no more stones. They did not report any pooling, itchiness, tenderness, or uh, 
uh, what's the other one is, okay. Uh, so there was zero by day eight. And what we found at six weeks was that had remained the same. There was no discomfort from the steam group ever again with those stitches. Now, with the control group, by day eight, only three out of four of them were having discomfort with the stitches, okay? But still a significant amount of them, 75%, if you were to take a statistic. Then what we found at the six week mark is they had actually gone up. Whoever had that success with getting the stitches to go down, it had actually gone back up by the six week mark. And the entire control group was still dealing with some level of cooling, itchiness, or tenderness with their stitches at the six week mark. Mind you, this is when people are supposed to be fully healed and ready to return to sex and exercise and their normal routine. Now, this is something that Kimberly talks about. Look, if you've got stitches, you know, that's going to make sex painful. That's going to make sex um, un, uh, you know, uncomfortable, right? And so if you find that uh, women, women's stitches aren't healed by that six week mark, there's no way that women are going to be ready to um, return to their normal routine. So anyways, we have a huge finding here and how useful vaginal steaming can be. Now, people always ask, well, what is it? Like, is, is it like a sitz bath or, or why is it different than a sitz bath? Steam penetrates, it penetrates the cells. So when it comes to stitches, what I believe my experience would show me that the steam is able to clean the stitches and in, in order so that there can be healing, so that there isn't that any signs of infection or, or, or those discomforts. I believe that the steam is able to heal the stitches or to clean the stitches on a whole nother level, which allows the skin and the stitches to heal. Yeah, there's less rooting from the, the tissue is more able to regenerate itself um, in a way that, and this again, this is my theory. Right. Um, that is there's not as much rooting when when sutures happen there's scar tissue scar tissue creates rooting rooting is where the scar tissue finds a point of connection onto some other nearby tissue or organ and then as that skin is pulling i mean that's the sensation right we've all probably had a scrape on our arm or a knee and when that scab comes over you feel that scabbiness you feel how tight your skin gets because of that. So I feel like it's allowing the tissue to come together in a way that's more flexible because there's more circulation in the system for the body to draw from, creating less rooting and less pulling on the other organs and tissues around. Right, right. Okay, so we are um, have a couple more uh, to talk about. We looked at contractions. So uh, what we found is that both the control and steam group had um, all of them had contractions by day four. Um, after by and we measured the contractions by uh, severe, mild, severe, moderate, or mild. Okay, and so we actually our steam group started with a lot more severe uh, contractions, as you can see by day four. So um, uh, by day eight, only two out of six of our steam group still uh, reported contractions, and all of the contractions were mild. Whereas by day eight, the control group, uh, still three out of five of them were dealing with contractions. And one of their contractions was still, were, uh, some of the contractions were still moderate. Um, at six weeks, uh, two out of the five control groups still had contractions. Um, whereas there were never any, uh, by six weeks, all the contractions were completely resolved. In the steam group. So when you think two out of five at six weeks for the control group were still dealing with contractions compared to none, that's pretty significant as well. Right, as women are supposed to be fully healed up and returning to their normal routine, uh, you don't want to be getting hit by contractions, <laughs> you know. And those contractions are again, it's something that's going to be related to the lopia because the contractions happen in order to push the lopia out. So these contractions are also a sign that those women weren't getting. Uh, are some, are some, they're showing us some indicator of how much of that lopia has actually expelled from. Okay, and then the last thing we looked at, uh, we looked at bowel movements. What we found is that, um, okay, what we found was that, okay, so what we're measuring is how the regularity of bowel movements. And what we found was uh, by day four, everybody was, uh, you know, around this point. At day eight, the steam group had more regularity of their bowel movements. 
uh, and then that went down a little bit after they stopped steaming. Whereas with the control group, you know, they were starting, uh, you know, right here, and then by day eight, they were they found themselves more constipated, and at six weeks, they were almost entirely constipated, so not having the same regularity of bowel movement. Okay. Um, and then the next thing we looked at were hemorrhoids. Um, so we started with three people in the control group with hemorrhoids, and at day eight, those same three people had hemorrhoids, and at six weeks, there was the same. Okay, so there was no difference in the hemorrhoids between day four and six weeks without steaming. Our steam group, we actually had more hemorrhoids, uh, starting with four of them at day four. Uh, by day eight, the hemorrhoids had gone down to none. Okay, so the hemorrhoids were seemed to be completely resolved with the steaming by day eight. And then as the steaming went away, the hemorrhoids actually, two hemorrhoids then uh, appeared at that point. So um, pretty significant finding when it comes to hemorrhoids um, and a woman's ability to be able to have those bowel movements. So again, these might be related to those, those bowel movements as well um, and, and the regularity the women were experiencing. Okay, that is the data. So now we can move into the questions. Everybody, please do me a favor and can you go and put the questions, there's a, somewhere at the bottom that says Q&A. If you put your questions there, it's a lot easier for us to make sure that we get to all of the questions because sometimes we can miss them in the chat. So we're gonna open it up to Q&A now and I will start with um, a couple of those questions that I saw um, at the beginning. Okay, so uh, Kelly uh, wrote in and she said that, uh, that steaming, um, uh, her midwife recommends uh, not steaming until the bleeding has stopped and, and that she showed her midwife the study and her, her midwife stuck to it and still says, look, I don't recommend steaming until the bleeding has stopped. So what I wanna say is that again, vaginal steaming for postpartum is a universal practice and it's done differently everywhere. Okay, so I'm not sure what that midwife's experience is, um, that, that she wants it to stop or where she's gotten those directions. But like, for example, I did uh, learn in Palau that steaming is done, but it's not done until like 30 days, right? So in that case, they're waiting until the steam, uh, until the bleeding stops. In Cambodia, on the other hand, oh, oh sorry, let me share an example of a, 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 a granny midwife in the South, an African-American midwife. Um, she steams uh, her clients uh, three times in a, three times within the first 24 hours after getting Okay, so what I want to say is there's a um, range of practice, okay, and that the practitioners who are administering the steaming have to do what they can, what, you know, they're going to do what is, makes sense for them and also with, within the scope of their practice and their experience. Mm -hmm. Now, I learned about steaming uh, from a, a postpartum steaming from a Ghanaian woman who recommended starting right away. So I personally started right away when I was still bleeding. And, um, and I believe that there are a lot of benefits to starting right away, um, although there are some safety factors. Now those safety factors, if somebody is still openly bleeding, if they have retained placenta and so they're heavily openly bleeding, steaming during that time could be dangerous. I actually recommend working with a practitioner in order to determine when it is safe to start steaming. Now, I think it's fine to follow your midwife's advice. I think there are benefits to waiting until the bleeding has stopped because then there's no safety issue. But there are also practitioners who know how to determine when the, when the bleeding has stopped and when it's only just lochia that's coming out rather than fresh bleeding and when it's safe to start steaming. There are a lot of reasons why it can be beneficial to steam right away. And I'll give you an example with actually one of my friends recently. She was in the hospital. She gave birth. She had a... Um, uh, she had the, um, what do you call it, the IV, and she had, so, sorry, during the birth, she was catheterized, okay, so they put a catheter in her, and after she gave birth, they were ready to release her, but she was not expelling, she was not urinating, because she was really swollen from the catheter, so they wanted to send her home with a catheter for five days, and then she would go back after five days and be able to take it out, which is really inconvenient, really uncomfortable. You know, and she was like, well, can I just stay in the hospital longer until I urinate? And they said, no. They said, we are discharging you because we have no reason to keep you. Okay, so it's a really interesting situation, okay? So I sent a steam practitioner over into her room, right? This is my best friend. I'm not going to let her go down like this because I knew that steaming would help her urinate. 
So a steam practitioner goes into the hospital, carries that steam box, goes into the hospital room, sets it up, sits her on the chair, and she immediately says, help me to the bathroom, I need to pee. So she goes to the bathroom and she urinates, and then they checked her again, and she had expelled all of the urine. Well, the doctor, completely unaware of vaginal steaming and what's going on here, said, I, I still want to send you home with the catheter. So she actually refused treatment because she, she felt, now after seeing how the steaming was able to stimulate her uh, urination, she felt that the catheter was going to be an unnecessary uh, intervention over the next five days when she had already seen that the steaming could help to resolve this issue. So there are all kinds of uh, like immediate issues that happen uh, right after giving birth that vaginal steaming has, um, can have benefit for. The other one is being able to have a bowel movement. You know, and, and Raquel mentioned that. She said one of the clients is like, I always have the most amazing bowel movements after you steam me. <laughs> you know, like it's glorious. Um, but, you know, again, so it can help to, for a lot of reasons, it can help that the bowel movements and the, ur the normal urination, which are necessary you know, in a hospital setting for a woman even to be discharged, to be able to use something natural to be able to resolve that can be really useful. However, there are safety indicators with steaming right away. And that's why I, so I train my practitioners to be able to determine when it's safe for somebody to start steaming. For this, I found that most people are, it's safe for them to start steaming by day four. Also, Raquel knows if it, Raquel, one of the reasons why, you know, why I needed her is because she's familiar with steaming. She knew and, and checked to make sure that everybody was safe to start steaming by day four. Mm -hmm. um, what I found is that most people are safe to start steaming by day four. What you want to look for is that the blood, that the locia is reducing and maybe starting to turn brown. Okay, that's a sign that the person is not actively bleeding. If there's any heavy bleeding, then that's, mm -hmm. you know, that's an indicator that you probably should wait or you need to work with a practitioner or to determine whether it's safe. Okay, so I actually really, there's a benefit of working with a practitioner because also the herbs can be adjusted based on what's going on with somebody postpartum. And I recommend that not only the herbs can be adjusted, but the duration of the steam session. So some people are better with a 10 minute steam session, some people are better with a 30 minute steam session. So I, I, and this is what I train my practitioners to be able to do. So I really recommend for everybody to work with a practitioner and Raquel is, she's the steamy chick midwife. And she's available. She does. Uh, she does actually does distance, distance consultations in order to be able to work with people, be able to do an intake and to analyze uh, what herbs they need, how long their steam set, setup should be, and when they're ready to get started. So I do recommend if you want to start sooner, uh, then find a practitioner that you could work with that could determine uh, if you need to start, if if it's safe for you, to, you know, when it's safe for you to start. Okay, and for people who, for practitioners who don't know when it's safe to start, I think it's actually a good recommendation to wait until the bleeding stops because you know that you're not going to cause any harm by that. So I'm not mad at people that say wait until the bleeding stops, but I also know that there are so many benefits. Like when you look at all of the benefits that happen with the steam group during days four to eight, that all happened with fresh locum, right? So there were so many benefits that they had uh, to be able to steam during that locum. I, uh, during my second uh, birth, I wasn't able, it was really hot. It was over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. I was so hot. And I just, I tried to steam, but I couldn't because of the heat. And I wasn't able to get in a lot of steaming until after the weather had cooled down, um, probably about six weeks after I gave birth. I believe that there was a huge difference in the steaming six weeks later versus the steam right away. I, I saw a very big difference in my, my body's ability to just return to its pre-pregnancy state. Okay, um, and then the, uh, the question, uh, and, the, and some people sent this question in even before the webinar started. What day do I start? What herbs do I use? Um, and uh, where do I get a steam sauna? Okay, so I, um, I no longer make steam saunas, so I put up a sauna marketplace where I find sauna makers all around the world, and I put up their saunas on my website so that people can find a steam sauna. There's also ways um, to, uh, you could take a chair, and if it, you could, Drill a hole through the chair. You can use a hole saw and drill a hole through the, the chair, and then you've got a, your own chair steam set up as well. Uh, you could take, uh, if you take a dining room chair, a lot of times uh, you can use some screws to take the seat off, and you can add a toilet seat right there, and you've got another steam sauna. So there's all kinds of ways to make saunas at home. So look around, check out your furniture, see if you want to convert any of it into a steam seat. 
Hertz or a steam box, um, or you can buy a sauna from a, a sauna maker. And um, and I do have a, a sauna marketplace on the Steam Institute website for people to find those. Um, as far as herbs, uh, there's a lot of people who sell herbs now. Um, I recommend, what I've found is that there's four different types of kind of like menstrual cycles, and I like to adjust the herbs based on those types of menstrual cycles, including in the postpartum. So for example, people who have short menstrual cycles, I found that they need herbs with chi tonics and they need anti-hemorrhagic herbs. Even in the postpartum, I like to give uh, people who had who have short cycles, I like to give them what I call the, gen the stevedic gentle herb, my gentle formula, okay? So it, in that way, again, if you wanna work and make sure that you're tailoring the herbs based on your constitution and, and uh, then working with a practitioner is a really good idea. Other than that, uh, the other thing is steaming is, again, it's, it's, a, it's a traditional practice that women have done. So the other thing to do is to look to um, the elders in your community, look to your grandmother and start to ask, was steaming ever done? And specifically ask postpartum, because that's a lot of times when people remember it. So you can use the herbs. I actually don't recommend like ordering herbs from across the world, you know, because you found that this one herb is so good at hearing that everywhere in the world there are herbs uh, that can be used for steaming. So the herbs are going to be just as tailored and just as different as all of the different places in the world that women have been using vaginal steaming. So I actually recommend using local herbs. Um, and I do have a class if anybody wants to learn how to, you know, which herbs and which properties they're looking for um, and do, don't have any access to any cultural traditional knowledge about it. I do have a course where I, I, I teach women to be able to, uh, what they're looking for to formulate herbs if they want to do it themselves. And then also there's herbs for sale that you can buy now. Okay. Um, okay. So let's see. Oh, we got eight more questions. Uh, Catherine Poulin asked what herbal blend was used for the study? So we used um, an herbal blend that I created. It's called the Steamy Chick Cleansing Herbal Blend. Okay. So uh, some of the key herbs in there are roses, um, white sage, and uh, parsley. Okay. Um, Catherine said, were any of the women sensitive users? Uh, Raquel, do you remember if any of them were, um, were sensitive? I remember us talking about this a lot, whether or not we would take sensitive users or not. Um, what do you mean by sensitive users? Uh, people with short cycles. Uh, or, okay. Yeah, uh, or excess heat. We didn't, we didn't analyze that beforehand. Okay. So we, yeah. So what we ended up doing is doing 15-minute steam sessions uh, because that's, in general, going to be safe no matter what somebody's cycles were like prior to pregnancy. Okay, I am a facilitator and recently worked with a new mom postpartum steaming. I correctly screened her to be safe for steaming on the fourth day. She was not actively bleeding using the gentle herbs. The days following her first steam, she experienced significant blood loss and passing clots. Okay, I had her stop steaming and focus on rest. Is there anything else to do in that situation? What is the likely reason for her onset of bleeding? So what happened was she had stopped bleeding because her circulation wasn't clearing out the lochia. When you steam postpartum, even after somebody stopped, a lot of times it'll cool that lochia out. So that's what happens. When she steamed, it started to cool that lochia out. And then also, uh, I would recommend if you haven't taken the postpartum course, you should take the postpartum, vaginal steaming postpartum course so that you're trained and understand uh, that process as well. And that's where it's important to understand what is normal bleeding in the postpartum. But generally, you can, you know, as midwives, we say, as long as you're not filling, like soaking a pad within an hour, like in an hour you soak a pad, then that your bleeding level is okay. So it sounds like that person was just starting to get the clearing that their uterus needs. But of course, you can't say that 100%. Right. Because most, I don't think I mentioned, but most of the time when I went to go see these women, I'm also looking at the blood and I'm, I'm asking to see their pads um, on top of what they're reporting to me. Well, the other thing um, is that the postpartum lochia looks a little bit different. So there actually may be a big gush of clots that come out. You know, that is something that can happen, but that's different than ongoing bleeding where she's filling up a pad per hour. What people will find is they steam and a bunch of clots came out and then they stop bleeding. 
and then they steam and a bunch more comes out, right? That's good. You're getting the loki out of there, <laughs> okay? Um, what herbs are used in a steam pot and how far away should you position yourself or the clients over the pot? It should be based on what is comfortable. Okay, different women have different levels of um, what's comfortable with steaming and it should be based on the woman's comfort. Uh, so the, the positioning, you know, it, it all just depends, you know, on the heat source and, and how far the person is and the person's uh, comfort level. And so you should always test it beforehand and make sure that it's something to turn it down or, or you know, take away the, the burner if need be or, or go up higher so that it's not as hot, whatever needs to happen. Were there any factors you wished to measure, measure in the study and didn't? Oh, good question. I, I wanted to measure uh, breast milk production and we didn't really get any clear understanding of uh, steaming in breast milk. Uh, that's something that personally, I believe that steaming helps to stimulate breast milk production as well. And I'll let the other ladies answer as well. Um, uh, just maybe more concrete info on their, their emotional health and support. Um, we did ask, but it, in the way that I, that we posed the question, it wasn't really like quantifiable. Um, but I would definitely look at the impact of steaming on, on mood and, and postpartum depression. Yeah, same for, for me. That was a big interest since the mental health checklist is one of Western medicine's answers to how we help women more postpartum, I would like to turn that on its head and say, if we give women more better physical care also, in this case, one thing I was concerned about was Raquel is such an amazing medicine woman. And I was like, how do we, dis how do we separate steaming from Raquel's presence? Because I believe that just having an amazing woman who's so wise and deep come to, to your house is so impactful in and of itself. Uh, but then I was also, when Raquel says that she felt bad for the people she couldn't steam, then that also means something to me because even she feels like as a midwife that this would just be part of her postpartum care and she's that convicted about how important it is that she would feel bad if she couldn't do it for someone. Uh, but yeah, as far as an area of study, I would just be, because Kelly and I were talking about at one point, what if we don't even use herbs and we just use steam or steam and salt or steam and rosemary to be, and we had three groups, one person. So what's the effect of just steam? What's the effect of steam with herbs? And then what's the control? But, you know, we are all um, dedicated amateur researchers. So uh, we... Um, there was some unforeseen challenges, you know, everyone says, oh, we should do more women's health research, and we experienced firsthand why it's challenging, because as you all, everyone on this call knows, birth is unpredictable, and we're working with people, not mice or robots, so uh, it's, it has its own challenges, but I would be really interested in people's self-reported satisfaction, in people's um, disponibilidad, uh, like readiness or openness towards intimacy whether that's with themselves or with a partner when they've had this care maybe body image uh, are just interesting things because we use the words identity and we have these catchphrases for uh, mental health that I think are so much more intricate than this and if we could um, if we had some data on that I think that would be helpful that said, I don't. We're, we didn't really do this data to convince doctors that this is an important practice. Uh, we don't really. We're not relying on that. And I hope you, as people who will care for yourself and care for others, are not waiting for doctor's stamp of approval because we're simply not asking the same kind of questions that they're asking. One of the things that we are trying to do in this study is come up with measures that actually quantify. What is postpartum healing? Because we don't have, we have zero, what is a doctor looking for at the six-week visit? They are looking to see that there's no open wounds, no infections, and no open source. And probably many of you on this call went to a six-week visit and didn't even get a, a manual or visual vaginal check because that happens a lot. You just go there and you say, how are you feeling? And if you say fine or okay or Whatever, they're like green light for sex and exercise. Here's some birth control and here's some antidepressants. So 
we're really trying to fan this open and say, well, actually, maybe lochia and bleeding has something to do with recovery. Maybe your uterine placement has something to do with recovery. And, you know, Raquel laid out all of the possible ramifications of uterine placement that other organs can be displaced, that scar tissue can actually form based on how the, how the organs are sitting in the pelvis. That impacts, that's why we have reboso and we have the faha and all of the belly binding traditions in order to support organ placement, in order to, to gather things in. Well, there's more to gather, or less to gather if you seem. So uh, we're, that's what we're really, those are the questions we're asking right now, is what are things we can look for that we can impact, that will impact from this direction? So that's what I, those are some things that I would want to know if this was done in a larger setting and that reminds me i also would be interested in postpartum depression and that's something that like all of us have a connection between how a woman is feeling about her body or what like birth injuries she's still dealing with or what healing she's dealing with versus how happy she is so i would have loved to see and know whether or not the steam group well i mean i don't i don't really need it to be studied or measured like i know that if a woman doesn't have a stitch stitch discomfort i know she's happier <laughs> you know, I know it's easier for her um, to focus on her baby and to focus on her matrescence transition, right? Transitioning into a child's body. Okay, so uh, I want to say because I um, I have to go. I'm looking for an apartment, and I have to get to the bank to get my cashier's check before the bank closes, um, which is pretty much one of the only things that could keep me off this call because I. I'm so grateful to both of you. I'm so happy that we got, I mean, it's kind of a miracle to think back to our first call that I think was in or around October and November last year. And we raised over $25,000 and we did it from, you know, I gave some sessions and I asked people to donate in exchange for the sessions and you, we put half, you supported by half price on herbs and we really wanted to pay Raquel well for her time. And, you know, we managed to like, do this and have something in rock and uh, Jale did such an amazing job with the graphs and present presenting the research in a way that um, is understandable. And also we should say that on Instagram, we have a fourth trimester vaginal steam study Instagram and we put all of the graphics up there. So they're easily shareable. So Francisca asked, how can we be able to support this? and other studies. So I'll let Kelly talk about other studies she's got going on. I don't have any other studies going on at the moment. Uh, but how you can support us in now and in the future, and not us, support women, support this work, support the studies, is sharing those on social media. Because if you share the one that's about um, infection or, or lochia, if you share the one on stitches or whatever is the one that connects to you and that moves you based on your own, you know, someone here wrote in and said, you're right, I didn't get a manual check his six weeks. Uh, then it's, it's really just about this grassroots movement. Share your experience. And women just do this for each other anyway. But, you know, just talk about what, how this is helpful for you. And also take care of yourself. Um, really take care of yourself and take these things seriously. If you're having, you know, horrible periods, if your fibroids are debilitating you, if you're wetting your pants, sometimes we forget about things because we're so busy taking care of our kids or taking care of our aging family members or taking care of our partners that our, our experience gets left until last. Or if you're a care provider, right? Like if you are a postpartum doula or you are a midwife, then you are an activist and you have a helping empathic personality. And so make sure that you're taking care of yourself as well as you can financially, because it, it all impacts the pelvic health and it impacts our collective. Because right now that's what we're trying to repair is this sort of rupture that we've had in this lineage of wisdom. So and also, if you are a scientist, if you work at a university, if you work at the National Institute of Health, then pass this on. You know, people keep going, oh, well, you should study this. And me and Kelly are like, oh, why? Why are we supposed to do that? Like, here's the baton, friend. We're passing it. Go ahead and, and find, find your own study. 
maybe by next year we'll be ready for another funding thing. But for now, if your move so moves, go ahead. So um, <laughs> love you guys. Thanks for being here. Thank and you so much, Kimberly. Bye. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Yes, I knew this was going to go over. I cannot keep a uh, talk within an hour. It, Kimberly had to leave. Goodness gracious. Okay, but I'll, I will stay. I'll be patient with you guys. I can talk about this all day long. So let's talk. Let's just get to these questions. Okay. <clears throat> I know you all were working with postpartum women, but I'm curious if you have worked with women who had scar tissue and issues with the pelvic region after radiation. Have you noticed any softening of the scar tissue in the vaginal canal, et cetera? <clears throat> I worked with one woman who had uh, cancer. I think it was in the vulva. And she had had uh, uh, surgeries and radiation. And the steaming was able to help her. She had pain during sex and hadn't been able to have sex. I think the surgery had been like four or five years. She hadn't been able to have sex, of course, with her husband. So the steaming was able to get her back to uh, like uh, painless intercourse and pleasurable intercourse um, within a few, within the first time that she tried, basically. After steaming, she steamed. And she was still, you know, she was very nervous and she waited. And I think she, she stayed for about a month and she was able to get back to, um, to intercourse after that because of the pain from the scar tissue. Um, so I've also seen it work uh, when a woman, she had um, really bad sexual abuse and it had actually caused uh, um, scar tissue in the vaginal canal and at the bottom of the cervix. And the steaming actually completely cleared that scar tissue uh, on the cervix as well as the vaginal canal. To the point that doctors had told her because her cervix was closed off with scar tissue, she wouldn't be able to get pregnant. And she got pregnant actually uh, within one month after starting steam, uh, which you know, is considered a miracle after, she, uh, I think she had six gynecologists told her she would never be able to get uh, pregnant enough. Um, and then you have, uh, there was another woman I worked with who had uh, scar tissue in her uterus because of a fibroid surgery. So she, she had fibroids, they did a fibroid surgery and her, her uterus scarred over. And she was also dealing with infertility because of the scar tissue and that the uh, egg would never be able to implant in the uterine walls, which is necessary for, uh, for natural childbirth or for natural conception. So she uh, worked on, was steaming for three months and then did an ultrasound with her doctor and the scar tissue was actually completely gone. The, the doctor couldn't find any scar tissue at all. So, um, but then, you know, with postpartum scar tissue, um, you know, it's, it's give or take. Like, um, in fact, I'm, I'm sad Kim, Kimberly left, you know, before this question because she actually works uh, extensively with scar tissue. Her and um, Ellen Heed uh, have actually, they train uh, scar tissue remediation um, experts or, and uh, practitioners. They're called stream practitioners. And I would recommend working, so they do recommend vaginal steaming, but they also recommend massage and castor oil packs and other things. I don't know the full extent to what they, the work that they do, but I do recommend finding a stream practitioner for scar tissue uh, to do as well as vaginal steaming. You can always start vaginal steaming and see if it completely resolves the issue, which it has in certain cases. But if you find that, that you're, there's still further to go, then I would definitely reach out to a scar tissue uh, practitioner, a stream practitioner. And on the four trimester vaginal steam study.com, you know, the biggest questions we get is I have prolapse help. Who, who can help me? How can I get started? What I did was I put a list of all of the postpartum practitioners that I could find. <laughs> okay. So you'll find uh, parasteam hydrotherapists are the practitioners that I train, but there are so many other postpartum practitioners that can help. So I put stream practitioners on there as well as a link to the website about stream and then various other postpartum practitioners that I could find. Okay. Um, what's the next study you have planned and when does the fundraising start? Oh, thank you for asking. So, uh, anybody who supports Steamy Chick is supporting research. Okay. So my company, I, I, I'm not sure what I haven't calculated how much, what percentage is going towards research, but, um, a good deal of the proceeds, um, of the revenue from Steamy Chick go towards research. So supporting my company helps to support the research, helps to support me in the research, uh, number one. As far as the fundraising, um, if you're on my email list, 
you'll see if I'm going to do any uh, crowdfunding for another uh, research um, for another research study. And then as far as when the next study is planned, I actually really loved doing a small in-house study just to prove a point. Okay, because uh, I've talked to universities, I uh, have you know been in designing different studies, and it, it's going to be a long process. Uh, one university wants to do a study, and it's we're in the, it's supposed to take five years to be able to get that study funded, right? And, and the, the grant that we're going for is $5 million, okay? So really, you know, a long time and a lot of money we're talking about. But what I, I loved doing this, this quick little study because, you know, again, I have this idea, I have designed these studies of what we want to be looking at. And so to just do a quick little in-house study is really cool. And I actually think that that might be the role that I play going forward. It's just doing a quick little in-house studies that can prove to those of us who are doing this, um, you know, that there's something to it and that we can also use to defend ourselves, right? Because I do get picked on by people, oh, this is your, you know, this and that and CB is dangerous and, you know, just whatever. And, and doctors, my doctor said we shouldn't be doing this. They said it's dangerous. They said it's gonna, you know, ruin the mech. The, the microbiome of the vagina and it's just like you know what it's just not and this is just misinformation when we actually look at the data you don't find that to be true right and then also doing these studies uh then i feel like the people that are that are full-time researchers can then see these studies and 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 re replicate them right so i think my i think my role going forward is going to be doing these like small studies to prove the point right to prove the efficacy of the practice. So um, if I am completely honest, the next one that I would like to do, um, I, I am actually in discussions with somebody about doing one on the vaginal microbiome. The biggest misinformation about vaginal steaming that you see uh, people are going to, when you say you're going to vaginal steam, somebody's going to send you an article that says that it's going to uh, ruin the, the vaginal microbiome. I haven't found that to be true at all. I found that it, that it, um, that it uh, helps the microbiome. And not only that, I've talked to researchers who are experts in the vaginal microbiome, and they have ideas on why. Like, they can explain the science of how and why the steam could possibly be um, helping to improve the healthy bacteria in the, in the vagina. So I would love to see that study uh, carried out, because I think that's going to be a big one to defending ourselves from people who say that we shouldn't do it um, or that it's bad for vagina, which it is not, okay? Um, so I want to do one on the vaginal microbiome and vaginal steaming, and then the next one I would like to see are fibroids. Fibroids are a huge problem. Uh, one in, I saw a statistic that said one in three women you know, will have fibroids over her lifetime, and that it's even higher for African-American women. And, um, and specifically, women undergo surgeries for fibroid. One of, my, one of my friends recently did a fibroid surgery, and they didn't even get the fibroid. You know, so, so she's in pain. She's recovering right now. And she's actually working with one of my practitioners to help her recovery, even from the surgery. But the doctor's going, okay, well, yeah, we're going to see how your, your uh, recovery goes. And then we'll get you scheduled and we'll go in there again. You know, I don't like seeing this. You know, and I think, um, so my fibroids when I was seeing and then when one of my friends uh, early on in 2013 told me she had fibroids, I was like, oh, well, my fibroids went away. I wonder if steaming did it. Maybe you should try steaming. The fibroids actually fell out in the toilet. So, um, so that's a big one. People come to me for the fibroids, and I've seen that with the steaming, uh, somebody does it uh, consistently that the fibroids will reduce in size. So, um, and and it's rare for them to fall out, but there are more instances where they have fallen out as well. So it depends on where the fibroid is located. So those are the two that I would like to do, probably these in-house studies. And then if you guys are on the steamy chip email list, you'll see information about that. Uh, I think that it will probably be in a year from now. <laughs> I think one study per year is like a good amount. It takes a lot of, uh, it takes a lot of work. Uh, thank you so much though for asking. You know, fundraising, you know, um, is a big part of it. It fundraising, you know, was a really big part of it. That, that was what determined the fact that we only steam for five days instead of 30 days. That's what determines that we stopped once we had those, those 12 people rather than going with 30, right? Because, you know, we had Raquel on the, uh, uh, she was full time, you know, during this study, you're paying her full time, you know? So, um, so, so yeah, that's, you know, I think, 
I think we have enough skills and, 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 and stuff, you know, and steam supplies that really the biggest thing is, is being able to have that research. Um, can you talk at all about how midwives can use steaming during labor for relaxation and or opening the cervix? Okay, so this is done. Um, and I, uh, very specifically, um, uh, I have a woman uh, practitioner in my courses. Her name is Monica Valova. She lives in the Czech Republic. And she found that vaginal steaming was used traditionally in the Czech Republic for labor, for, for past labors. And she herself used it. And she found that her labor was really quick. And so now she works with other practitioners and midwives and now nurses uh, in helping to speed up uh, labor and what she has found is that again, I, I think they do it once the water breaks if a woman steams uh, You know as often as she wants during that time what they found is that the births happen in six hours or less Okay, so it's a very interesting. I you know I, I wish she was here that she could share it Maybe I'll, I'll set up something with her where she can share what she has seen and, and what she's found um, but it's really incredible and to the point that she has been educating the midwives and the nurses in the country about it, and they actually just started using it in hospitals. Okay, so um, I do think that some training uh, may be necessary. I do think it's important to work with a midwife anytime you're working in a birth situation. And Raquel, you can go ahead and I saw you. I've, I've definitely used it to, to prep for labor, um, especially in early labor, just to help. You know, I think a lot of people kind of jump the gun in early labor and we need to really like help to relax the body so the process can facilitate a lot easier and more smoothly. And so it definitely helped it to kind of re-regulate, you know, contractions. And um, and yeah, I think there's definitely some some training that needs to happen, some awarenesses of like birth regularities and, and things, but it, it can be super supportive for, for the whole problem. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. NJ um, says uh, she was contributing. She says it also helps with connection to your baby and steaming. I notice I am much more aligned and loving towards my baby, my husband, and myself after steaming. And I can account for that too. Same, you know, like there's just something about that. And I actually do have a, a little bit of a theory about that. I think that the steaming might be because it's stimulating the cervix and the vaginal canal. The cervix and the vaginal canal, um, when they're stimulated, it, it sends a, um, an indicator to the brain to release oxygen. I actually think that the steaming is creating that stimulation and it's releasing the oxytocin, which is relaxing the woman, helping her to feel more loving. I th and oxytocin is also involved in breast milk production, so I think it's also helping with the breast milk production. Um, yeah. That's just a theory. We'll see. I don't even know if I could study that one at some point, but that's what I think is happening. I had to explain it. Um, is the postpartum training included in the vaginal steam facilitator program? So I have a vaginal steam facilitator certification that is just all about the safety of vaginal steaming, the contraindications, the sensitivities, the herbs, and the setup. That is required, okay, for everybody to know the basics. And then after that, you can take the postpartum vaginal steaming course. It's, it's separate. Um, it's, it's not everybody is, is a birth worker. So that one's a separate course for those that do want um, to do that. And then also if somebody wants to just learn what they need to do at home for themselves, then I would recommend those two. The vaginal steam facilitator certification and then the postpartum vaginal steam. So then you'll know everything that you need. You'll know how to formulate the herbs. You'll know how to set it up and how to, how to screen and do the intakes. Um, Katrina says, doing fourth trimester is left for parasitic pros since there is bleeding, question mark, or facilitators can do this. Um, so vaginal steam facilitators, my vaginal steam facilitator certification does not include the direct postpartum training, although it does include how to formulate the herbs and how to set it up. Then there's also a postpartum vaginal steaming class that the facilitators can take right away. Some of them do. And so then what we do is I have a vaginal steam directory of all my uh, practitioners. It's vagin vaginalsteamdirectory.com, or you can find it on the Steam YouTube website. And what we do is if somebody has taken the postpartum class, then I put postpartum specialists. So you're going to want to look for the postpartum specialist. And you can actually uh, search it. If you're on the map, you can search postpartum, and it will pull up the practitioners who are the postpartum specialists. 
And then um, all of the parasitic hydrotherapists um, are trained and able to do that. Um, somebody says, I'm a vaginal steam facilitator and I wanted to know if I could add the link to the study on my website. Absolutely. So we put the study on its own website, fourthtrimestervaginalsteamstudy.com, so that you guys can share it far and wide. We put a link for you to download it if you want to print it out. We put up a, a slideshow in case you want to present present it like how we did today like I think you know for example midwives at your next peer review it might be interesting to pull up the study and take a look at it you know some of these indicators or anybody oh doula doula groups you know when you guys have your your meetings you know it might be interesting to, to pull it up and to present it um, or anybody that's interested in presenting this for any reason we have that there again because you know we said once we had the study we said okay well who do we want to, to give the study to decided we want this study to be for women and we think that the most important and most relevant use of the study is when women are sharing it with other women um, either in person at meetings uh, word of mouth and on social media so that's why I also uh, hired somebody to create the Instagram fourth trimester vaginal steam study um, account so that all of the information is accessible all of the time I think that is where this Postpartum revolution healing is happening so often. It's on social media and women sharing with other women. Okay, so we have another question. Does vaginal steaming help cervical dysplasia, uh, like high abnormal cells on the cervix? So there have been uh, numerous women that I've worked with who had cervical dysplasia and they worked with steaming and then the next time that they were uh, tested, they did not have cervical dysplasia. So my answer would be, I believe so. I, I, I believe so, right? But I don't have a study to show that. But yes, it helps with cervical dysplasia. The cool thing about steaming is that, you know, the cervix, the, you know, the steam, it goes to the, to the vaginal canal opening, and then it ascends up the vaginal canal, and it touches the bottom of the cervix directly. So whether or not uh, the steam gets into the uterus, the steam touches the bottom of the cervix, and that's where those abnormal cells are. That's also where uh, cervical cysts are, and that's also where cancer is. That's also where HIV is. So the steam is directly touching those areas. And one of the herbs that I like to include in my blends are antiviral herbs with anti antiviral properties, specifically in order to clear any viruses in those areas. Okay. Is it possible to have a consultation with you? You mentioned the list of references for stream practitioners. Where do I find this? Thank you. Um, so I am not doing personal consultations right now. Right now I spend all of my time training my practitioners, but I brought Raquel in-house, the steamy chick, so that she could do the consultations. And in fact, she's more qualified. She's a licensed midwife, so she can do so much more than I can do anyways. And if you're in the LA area, then you're even more lucky because she can actually do, uh, you know, in-house visits. But um, so I would recommend um, if you go to the steamy chick website and you say find a practitioner, you're going to see Raquel pop up there. And you're also going to find the vaginal steam directory. You might as well look and see what vaginal steam practitioners are in the area as well. Um, and then as far as other postpartum practitioners, um, I on the fourth trimester vaginalsteamstudy.com website, I put a list of practitioners that are even beyond my practitioners because I'm not the only one that's training. And, and it's not the only skill for postpartum. Um, so what I did was I put parasteam hydrotherapists on there, um, which are my practitioners. Um, but then I also put all of the other um, like trained people, including the stream practitioners and the links to be able to get access to them. Okay. Um, so again, that you can try to find somebody uh, close to you, but it's also great to work with Raquel. She does video consultations um, and she can, she can help quite a bit, um, even if you're not in the LA area. Have you had experiences with and women? I just like the link for my contact and oh. for the, the steam chick directory. I just put the link in the, in the question. So okay, you perfect. Have. Thank you, Raquel. Okay, so then we have um, Zainab writes, have you had experiences with women dealing with PCOS and steaming? Yes, and there have been numerous cases and I've seen over and over again that the steaming helps to um, get these women out of the pain and a lot of the negative symptoms that they're having, like acne, and a lot of the different symptoms of PCOS go away with steaming. Um, and then there's no evidence to show if the PCOS goes away all the way because you would have to um, do ultrasounds before and after, and specifically when the, the, um, 
when the cysts are appearing in order to determine that. However, what I've seen is that when women with PCOS steam, they're able to get their periods regular, they're able to get out of pain, and they're able to get rid of all of the negative symptoms of PCOS. So, so to me, that's an indicator that the steam may be solving that issue. I think that it resolves it, my theory, because it increases the circulation. And I think increasing that circulation helps those cysts. Those cysts are filled with, with fluids. I think it helps that fluid to disperse so it's not sitting there and it can't create those cysts. I think the increase in the circulation just helps the uterus do what it's normally supposed to do. I think it, it increases the health and the function of the uterus so that that PCOS doesn't exist. Um, but yes, if you have, and, and, and if you know anybody dealing with PCOS, I definitely would recommend that they get in contact with, um, with one of my practitioners. Yeah, I couldn't have said it better myself. That's exactly what I would have said. Yeah. <laughs> well, I learned it from you. Raquel is an expert in anatomy. So like I had to bring her in because I like my practitioners to know the anatomy. And when I brought her in, I just couldn't believe how much more I learned about the anatomy. And the more I learn about the anatomy, the more I'm understanding exactly how it's actually um, and why the steam is affecting those areas. Okay. Will we be able to have a recording of today's talk? Great question. Yes. I'm going to send out a recording uh, probably later today. Okay, and that's the final question. Thank you guys. Um, Raquel, we were gonna do the final takeaways of the study. Um, I've obviously talked a lot, but Raquel, maybe you could conclude if you, had, if you had those for us. I mean, I think just the takeaway is just how important this is, you know, and how, how moved, how many people we've had on this talk. And, um, and I think, just how powerful we are to do this work you know it was you know four people really five if you include you know my assistant who just did all of this work together and so you all can get with your communities and have impact on your health talk about this share this like it's huge what five people can do it's huge what two people can do it's huge wow. what one person can do you know. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much, Raquel. I could have said it better. And with that, um, we will conclude. Bye, everybody. Bye.